thank you, Barbara, Sasha, and Typographics for having me here today. It's, it's a real honor to be speaking here to all of you today and everybody tuning in live stream. Um, as Barbara mentioned, my name is Ellie Kim. I'm senior art director for the design team, which is part of created a team at the Museum of Modern Art. And I've been there several years and um, had an opportunity to work on really, really creative and exciting projects and work with really amazing group of people. So I'm gonna talk about today about what we do as a team and what our process is in terms of thinking and making and essentially how we use typography to um, make an experience of the museum. So I have a lot packed in, so here we go. Um, quick history of MoMA, the Museum of Modern Art was founded on November 7th, 1929, which is nine days after the Wall Street crash, and it was found by Abby Aldrich Rockefeller, Louis P. Bliss, and Mary Quinn Sullivan, and they went on to become known as the ladies. They debuted in a suite of rented rooms in a building um, on 57th and 5th Avenue, and went on to become one of the most influential museum, modern uh, art museum in the world. So fast forward 90 years to today. After tomorrow, the museum is actually going to um, close temporarily as we head towards the final stage of our renovation design by Diller Scofidio Renfro in collaboration with Gensler. And we'll be opening to public again in October with newly expanded spaces and unprecedented ways of showing our collections. So this means a lot of work, a lot of work is cut out for the team. Um, our team is led by Rob Giampietro, who's the director of design, and is made up of 16 of these hardest working people in the business. Um, I know everybody works hard and talented, but these guys really move mountains, so they're amazing. Um, all the work I'm showing you today are created by these people, so full credit goes to all of these people. These are some photos um, from our studio. We you know, we do a lot of meetings, group crits, we put stuff on the wall, discuss cats, there are a lot of cat mommies and daddies at work, you know, color matching and all that stuff. And we work on wide range of projects being in-house for a museum and we basically work on everything. So exhibition title walls, which you guys are familiar with, wayfinding and signage stuff, visitor guides and maps, marketing and communication, special events, retail, so on and so forth. So my talk today in a nutshell is this. How do we use typography to shape the experience of the museum? So let's start with the basics, basics which is the typeface. So MoMA used a version of uh, Franklin Gothic as long ago as 1930s. And these are some of the printed materials found in our archives, which is uh, like an exhibition announcement card. In 1964, Shmaif Geismar established MoMA's typographic identity by introducing its distinctive Franklin Gothic uh, number two logo type when the museum underwent a major expansion during that time. And in 2004, Ed Paz, who was the director of design back then, um, along with Bruce Mao Design, approached Matthew Carter, who was also speaking here tomorrow morning, uh, to redraw and refresh this logo type into a new custom typeface, MoMA Gothic. It was a digital recreation of Morris Fuller Benton's 1902 Franklin Gothic, digitized from a tray of lead type in MoMA's permanent collection. And in 2009, Julia Hoffman, who was a creative director during that time, worked with Paula Scherer at Panagram and established an identity system based on this logo type and made MoMA Gothic the principal type of the museum. And until recently, MoMA Gothic was supported by a number of loosely related typefaces like ITC Franklin Gothic, News Gothic, and Trade Gothic. So now 2017, we commissioned Christian Schwartz at Commercial Type with input from Matthew Carter again, to synthesize the aspects of all of these fonts into one cohesive family that is legible and flexible for full range of our typographic needs. And this is called MoMA Sans. As you can see, the difference between MoMA Sans, which is in black outline, and MoMA Gothic in pink outline is very subtle. I mean, MoMA has been using Franklin Gothic since 1928, so it has been a museum's iconic voice for a very long time. So that's not something we wanted to lose. So we want to keep that familiarity and legacy. So we asked Kristen to, to redraw this logo and bring, enhance it and bring it forward for us. 
We went through many rounds to review. This is just one of extremely many review process we were in. Just looking at different weights, letter spacing, X heights, counters of the O, and etc. Here's a full set of our MoMA sands. We have both regular and condensed, as well as italics of everything you see here. Out of all the weights we have, MoMA sands bold is our uh, principal uh, weight, which means we use it for ma majority of our brand messaging um, for the museum, therefore a critical component of our design system. So back to the main question, how do we use type to tell, to shape the experience of the museum? There are many different types of experiences and touch points that create one complete museum experience for the visitors. And I think one of the major one has to be the exhibition, because that's why people come to the museum. So how do we use type to tell a story of an exhibition? Among many typographic needs, exhibition title law is a place where we can be very expressive because it's essentially our interpretation of the curatorial vision and the thesis of the show. So for this, when we begin, we ask ourselves a set of these questions. One, what typeface should we use and how? So we use both MoMA brand font um, along with other uh, custom or different typefaces, depending on what the concept is. But I think what's more important than what we use is how it's being used to tell a story of an exhibition. So we think about what makes each show unique and different and find innovative ways to tell that story uh, by using type. So, you know, we could be using MoMA brand typeface for all the shows at any given time in the building, but you might have noticed that they all look different. What about the materiality? Materiality here is not about decoration. It's, it's closely associated with a meaning and connects to a specific, meaning, a specific feeling. And it can be a driver in creating a transformative experience for everyone. So what is the environment? What is the spatial relationship between you and your design in the space in which you occupy? And obviously, this too have a power to transform you to a different place. So I want to walk you through our exhibition design process to show you how we actually approach these questions. So first, we meet with curatorial team about the exhibition. So this is like a mini art history session that everybody loves going to at the museum. So after that, we then begin our brainstorm um, within our team. And we gather curator's intention, key artwork, artist statement, any visual inspiration and throw it up on the board as like a mood board and then design begins. Um, we usually pair two designers for each show, so from beginning to end, they're uh, working really closely. Then we review floor plans and mini models to get a sense of space and also the flow and narrative of the show, which is gonna eventually influence your design. So, and then we begin sketching. So here are some of our sketches that our senior designer Kevin and I did for Items as Fashion Modern, which was MoMA's first fashion exhibition in 70 years. It was created by Paola Antonelli and Michelle Millar Fisher. And this show explored 111 items that, items of clothing and accessories that have had a strong impact on our lives in the 20th and 21st centuries. The items that were featured were really diverse from high to low, like Chanel and Rolex to flip-flops and white t-shirts and safety pins. So this being our first fashion exhibition in 70 years, we, including the curatorial, wanted to give a strong MoMA's voice. So we decided to use MoMA Sand, which is our brand typeface. We also wanted this exhibition to be relatable, educational, and thought-provoking. So we incorporated these items into the title wall. And as you can see, we tried many different ways of interpreting the same idea. But at the end, we realized it was best to go with a straightforward list that was in hierarchical and present them with equal level of importance. Another really important component of this entire title wall was this. It, it was a projected slideshow of personal photographs, and it was it was added at the last minute. It, it was Paola's idea, which turned out to be really great. So basically, we wanted to show how these 111 items were used in everyday lives by everyday people. 
So at the last minute, we called for submissions and received over 300 photos in a very short period of time. So these are what some of those look like. I mean, obviously, each of these photos were loaded with personal memories and stories, so it became a very crucial part of the narrative of the exhibition. And it became a big kick because everyone in the slideshow, I think like almost everybody came to like check themselves out on the, on the wall. And just by the fact like being very inclusive that way, it generated a lot of um, excitement, attention that we wanted. So it was really successful. And here's a rendering of the final design. So once you have a direction set, we do a full scale test and we treat that as like a part two of design. Because up until this point, you really haven't see, experienced your design in live scale. You're just like looking at your end design, right? So this is an opportunity for us to experience the space. And then from here, we make adjustment about placement and size. And we finally land at somewhere that looks and feels right. So once you lock it in, the installation begins. Um, which is one of our favorite stage of the process because we work with really amazing installers and also it's the day when everything comes to life and you're done. And for this show, we silk screened all the components, but usually um, for all the other shows, we do paint mask, which is essentially like stenciling, but also vinyl as well. So it really depends on what your design is. And here's the final title at the opening and close up of the list. So now that we went through the process, I'm gonna quickly run through some other title walls that are using MoMA fonts and some are outside of that to show you how exactly we've been using type four exhibitions. So this is Robert Heineken Object Matter, which is about a photographer pushing boundaries of traditional photography, experimenting with unconventional process. Nine plus one ways of being political. It speaks about architecture and design as example of protest. So the MoMA font here is turned into a stencil. And this uh, tear off thing that you're looking at on the left are section, section panels that you see in individual galleries. So once like visitors take all of those and we put it all together and that's how we created the final title for the entrance. Ernie Gare, Carnival of Shadow. This show reflects on early animation and moving image graphics. So the title design was inspired by the early 20th century shadow graph toy. A world of its own. It's about a studio photography practice and creating an additional dimension beyond given by the world. Hence the manipulation of the perspective on the corner of those two walls. This one's 100 years in post-production. So it's about the recently discovered footage, um, unedited, unseen footage of black cast feature film um, created in 1913. So the title design here can be seen as dissolving or disappearing or appearing and revealing. And this was drawn by hand by our installer. So we gave her our elevation like sketch and she just walked in with like her box of um, color pencils and she just started drawing on the blank wall, which was amazing. So this was created for an art lab. I don't know if you guys are familiar with art lab, but it's a space for family and children um, and students. It's a space for them to come learn about art and also have a chance to experiment and learn through activities so they can actually make things with the staff there. So because of that, we often create animated title walls to be more engaging and more educational for the kids. Obviously, this one's all about process of making. So each letter were created to represent different texture and modes of production. It's another art lab, which is all about material. And you see those little discover box cubbies and kids could like pull those box out and touch all these materials and learn where they can find artwork in the museum that uses these type of materials. This one, it's for looking at Jerry Lewis, the Nutty Professor storyboards. So the museum recently was gifted the storyboards to the classic film, The Nutty Professor. So the stretch type here is inspired by a very specific, specific scene in the film where the main characters, like he's trying to like pull up a weight and then her, his arm like ended up stretching to the ground. So, kind of like a nod to that. 
This one's called uh, Unfinished Conversation. It's, it was an unusual one because first the exhibition plays with the idea of activism, debate, and resistance. So we decided the title will take a back seat and be in smaller scale, but instead we blew up uh, the intro text as a form of manifesto, which was very powerful. Club 57, um, Film Performance and Art in the East Village, 1978 and 1983. So Club 57 was located in the basement of a Polish church at St. Mark's, and it was a hub for creative activity for new modes of art, performance, music, and uh, fashion. So both design and materiality, which that Club 57 is created a neon sign, uh, expresses the energy of that counter culture. And at night, it was really beautiful because it was, there was a reflection and you see um, like the garden behind it. And um, I think the location design materiality really came together. And Damien, who was a designer of the show, like went beyond and created these wristbands and coasters for the opening party. These are some examples using other typefaces, which we do when MoMA typeface don't seem quite right. Um, the Edgar Degas, this was all about experimental radical works um, that were not his usual ballerina. So Vanessa Lamb, our designer at the time, was creating custom typeface uh, based on uh, historical leanings infused with contemporary bent. So she was inspired by this old French spe uh, type specimen from turn of the century, uh, which is the same period when Degas was experimenting with this work. And through a lot of sketches and noodling, she did a lot of tweaks and tests and created this set of alphabets. In combination of this with GT Sectra by Grilly Type, in these dark muted colors really spoke to the dark forms um, of his body of work of that time. In Centra of the Child, this is the last of my exhibition uh, images. It was about the nature of toys in the 20th century. So the typeface naturally gravitated toward innocence of a child. So after failing miserably trying to find a typeface that speaks to that, um, we decided to go straight to the source, a real child. So Ingrid, our creative director, he, she brought in her son. I think he was like six at a time or seven. Um, so she told him to write this. So he wrote it like three times and then he was done. He was gone. Um, <laughs> And we got our title, which is awesome. Uh, we just looked at how we use type to tell a story of an exhibition. So now how do we use type to tell a story of MoMA, the institution? Instead of just promoting individual exhibitions, we wanted to communicate our seasonality and bring people to MoMA at key moments. So in order to communicate that, uh, Rob and the team uh, worked with Order, which is a design studio in Brooklyn, New York here to work with us on addressing these needs and created a scalable design system that was consistent and gave us flexibility. So these are our basic brand elements, right? So MoMA Sans Bowl, which I spoke about, um, address block would look something like that. And we also have additional brand extension, which is PS1, as you know, and design store. The bold use of color is an essential part of MoMA's unique and enduring brand. It's something that's very recognizable as uh, MoMA. We've always encouraged use of bold color since Shermai Geismer days, and that's something that uh, we didn't want to lose. So this is a diagram of a module system of a layer of contents. So you see exhibition title, call to action, image or video content, and a MoMA info on the bottom. And these modules can move, grow, and change, which I'll show you. So these are building blocks. So let's say these are building blocks that create a module. Here's our exhibition title. But we can also abbreviate this and start using bold, larger type and create different texture. This is how we sign off with our logo, um, websites, locations, our sponsors. We mostly use our logo horizontally, but sometimes we do it vertically as a super logo when appropriate. These are some examples of our artwork of the season. Um, geometry of the artwork influenced the way uh, we design. Um, and we also try to keep the integrity of these by trying not to crop unless necessary. But of course, there is a lot more than art that goes into the museum. People come here, they interact with art, they interact with other people, they go to art labs. 
So these are a lot of the images that speak to that where we do purposely um, crop to create another layer of different stories. These are membership call to action. Um, while exhibition titles are black on color, these we make it really colorful, color on color, another nod to Shumai Fraser Day. And again, bringing artists' voice by using um, their quotes when appropriate. So when you put all these building blocks together, it creates exhibition modules. And the height of it uh, ranges because it depends on um, the height of the image. So we took this further by putting these individual modules into like a module stack, which creates a set of moments to re represent that whole season. So we, with that, we created this set of outdoor banners by cropping into different moments. And as a set, this represents our spring season as a whole. So a vertical is set of moments giving a sense of time, which is here season. Then horizontal can be series of moments of each exhibition where we dive a little deeper. So over time, exhibition goes through different moments, so we can communicate different type of messages depending on um, where the show is in the time. So with that, we can create dynamic modular systems. So if you imagine the yellow square on the top as a media frame, the season moves vertically while the exhibition can move horizontally in the frame. So media frame can change depending on like what unit you're working on, but the content modules can stay the same. We can use these modules and stacks for flat surfaces, as you've seen just now, but we went further and then asked ourselves, okay, well, then how does MoMA move? What is MoMA's motion system that express our identity in time and space? So we brought in Erica, Gorchev, and Pep Rally to help us create our motion system. So there are two important principles to this. One is movement. Elements in our motion system should move naturally and have graceful starts and landings. And the second is depth and layers. Depth and layering is an important part of our motion system that helps differentiate content and uh, ex uh, reinforce the expanded scope of our museum. So to understand how MoMA moves, we created this camera rig that pans over content strips in different layers. So together, movement and depth and layers create a parallax, which is a visual effect where objects appear to move at different speeds. Object closer to you move faster, and objects farther away, for you, uh, away from you moves a little slower. So this motion is based in reality, and it mimics the way we perceive the world and brings screen-based media to life. So when it's an application, it looks something like this. We wanted our motion to complement our bold graphic identity with sophisticated and purposeful motion, which you see here. So horizontal camera movement dives deeper into content, like you just saw for Miro, while vertical movement is a top level information, like a at a glance of our season. This is MTA Liveboard. So this one uses um, Super Logo in the center. Uh, which is, which is working really well because with three screens side by side, the sense of layer and depth, the parallax really comes to life and you get a more dynamic overview of what our season looks like. This is Link NYC, everybody's seen this. These are like in the middle of the road while like people are driving all the time. So it's an example of like a modified guideline to take into account the safety of a driver. So the motion is a little different here. So now how do we give sense of movement and excitement when it is not in motion? With the stack of modules that represent the season, as you know, we can create a patchwork of, or ribbons, or stacks, by grouping them together and create a module group representing the universe of MoMA, so to speak, which would look like this for spring. And this concept really helps us um, understand the season as a whole. You can crop into it and you can still recognize the brand. And because MoMA is pretty well recognizable, we have the luxury to crop really deep into it and I think it still have a recognizable brand moment. And this is how we translate into New York Times for Miro. Same system also works for uh, single exhibitions rather than a whole season. This provides opportunity to show as much of the collection as you like, or as
as little of the collection as you like. And this is our graphic sander manual, which is for internal use only, but this gives you a sense of what they are and how we use it uh, among ourselves. And this design system has been really great uh, setting us up, expressing the unified voice of the brand and the institution while allowing the designers the flexibility to express freely through multiple um, media and services. And most importantly, we can work very efficiently, which is really great. So as we get closer to reopening, we'll have a lot more to share. So check out our Instagram, which is MoMA Design Studio. We only have three photos or four photos right now, but we're going to keep updating as we get closer. Um, so come see us in October and see all of this come to life. Thank you.